Welcome to the Plato Paradigm, a paradigm shift in reading Plato's dialogues. Episode 162, IO530A to C. The next dialogue we'll look at is IO. In Greek, it is Ion, but in Latin transliteration, it is Io, just like Platon becomes Plato. And then in English, the long vowel shift has made Plato Plato and Io Io. Because English is in the Latin tradition, I will be pronouncing names in the English Latin tradition. This is a very short dialogue, which may or may not be a good thing. Perhaps it's because it's so short that people can't agree what it's about, and I don't really know either. So I hope that through reading the dialogue carefully, we might come to some more concrete conclusions. This dialogue is a conversation between two people. We do not know of any audience. Socrates is the main speaker, the one asking questions, and Io is a successful rhapsode. A rhapsode literally means a stitcher of song. We may imagine epic poetry as a patchwork of smaller poems, and the rhapsodes were able to stitch them together in ways which would please an audience. Once the Iliad and the Odyssey were written down, the order of the minor poems within the great epics was fixed. But there were also other epic works, and even with the Iliad and the Odyssey, there was still an element of stitching in competitions, wherein one rhapsode would begin reciting one of the poems, and then at some point the judges would tell him to stop, and the next rhapsode would continue from the place where the previous rhapsode had stopped. So now it's time for us to start, and Socrates is speaking. Ton io na hairen, pothen tanun he min epidedemikas, e oikothen ex efesu, udomoso Socrates alex epidauru ecton asclepieion. I trust that Io is happy. From where now to us have you come to visit? From whom? From Ephesus? Not at all, Socrates, but from Epidaurus, from the festival of Asclepius. By coincidence, Epidaurus, Athens, and Ephesus are on almost the same line of latitude. And Epidaurus, which is in the Peloponnese, is divided from Athens by the Saronic Gulf, while Attica is separated from Ephesus by the Aegean Sea. The most convenient way to reach Athens from either Epidaurus or Ephesus is by sea. And if Socrates happened to meet Io near the port, he would be making a plausible guess that Io was coming from Ephesus, his home city. But I suspect that he knew about the festivities in Epidaurus, and he also knows that Io is a rhapsode, and he probably knows that Rhapsody is one of the events in the festival in which Io would have competed. Therefore, he is simply giving Io the pretext to talk about his victories in Epidaurus. At the same time, Plato is telling the readers that this is Io of Ephesus, and not any other Io. If I'm right, and Socrates knows what Io has been up to, the next question is simply 
in order to prompt Io to talk about his successes in Epidaurus. Mon kai rapso don agona tithea sinto theo hoi epidaurioi. Panuge, kaites alles gemusikes. Surely the Epidaurians don't hold a competition of rhapsodes to the god? Absolutely, and of the rest of music. Epidaurus was famous as being the home of Asclepius, the god of medicine, and it is unlikely that Socrates would not have known which competitions took place there. There were athletic competitions, because as god of medicine, he would be honoured by the competition between healthy people who show what humans can do when they're not sick, presumably. There were also competitions in music, since it was believed that a healthy body required a healthy soul, and the healthy soul was expressed best in types of music, which includes actual music as we understand it, and dancing, playing instruments, and reciting poetry. We should note that although Socrates is asking about the competition of rhapsodes, Io mentions the rest of music as well. Were he an arrogant narcissist, I doubt that he would have mentioned the rest of music as well. Tiun egonizu tihemin, kai posti egoniso, ta prototon athlon en enkametha o Socrates. What then? Were you competing in anything for us? And how did you compete? I won the first prizes, Socrates. Is Io boasting or showing off, or is he simply answering Socrates' question? How did you do? I won the first prizes. It would be unusual if a professional rhapsode hid this information from anyone who asked him. You leges, agede hopos kaita panathena ya nikesomen, al estai tauta e antheos ethele. You say well. In other words, it's good that you say that. Make sure we win the Panathenaia as well. This will be, if the goddess wishes. I say goddess because Athena presides over the Panathenaia, but Io uses the stock phrase Ean Theos Ethele. Theos sounds like a god, but Theos is second declension, Masculine and feminine. The Pan Athenaia were the Athenian equivalent of the Epidaurian Asclepieia. Socrates doesn't even ask whether Io is going to compete in the Pan Athenaia. He assumes he will and simply requests that he win for us. This is interesting because. Although Io is from Ephesus, he is considered to be participating on behalf of Athens because Ephesus is under Athenian protection. In other words, it's part of the Athenian Empire. Now that Socrates has established that Io is a professional rhapsode and a successful one, he is now at liberty to talk to Io about Io's techne, the techne of rhapsody. Kai men polakiske zelosa humastus rhapsodus o ion tes technes. And indeed, I have often envied you, the rhapsodes, Io, for the techne. We may translate techne as art, craft, or skill, but the important point to remember is that for the Greeks, techne is a body of knowledge about a certain subject and the practical application of that knowledge. We may already suspect that Socrates will ask Io what sort of knowledge he thinks he has, 
we might think that this is an easy question because a rhapsode surely is someone who has learnt a lot of lines by heart, thousands of lines of a poet, and has the ability to present the lines in metre in a way which is pleasing to the audience. Here's the reason Socrates gives for being envious. Togar hamamentosoma ke kosmestai ae prepon humon enai te techne, kai hos kalistois finestai, hamade anankaion enai ent alois poetais diatriben, polois kai kagathois, kai de kai malista en homero, to aristo kai theotato ton poeton, kai ten tutu dianoian ek manthanen, me monon ta epe. Zeloton estin, for the fact that it is always fitting for your techne that the body is ornamented and that you appear to be as fine as possible, and also the fact that it is necessary to spend time not only with other poets, many and good, but in particular in Homer, the best and most divine of the poets, and to learn thoroughly his meaning, not only the words, this is to be envied. Whatever the case may actually be, Socrates sets himself up as an audience impressed in particular by someone who understands Homer, above all other poets, and not only remembers the words and can recite properly, but who understands what Homer is getting at and is able to express this in his presentation. We may remember that Socrates does this in another dialogue where there is no audience, Hippias Major, but there he changes his position over and over again and Hippias adapts himself in order to impress Socrates, or so he thinks. Whether this is what Socrates is doing here is still to be seen. If nothing actually changes, it will be hard to see that Io is adapting himself to what he thinks will impress Socrates. That is to say, if Io consistently presents himself as the expert on Homer and understands Homer and not only remembers all the words properly, that may be his consistent position and it may not be that he is simply trying to impress Socrates here and now. As I say, it's a short dialogue and it can therefore be quite difficult to understand. <laughs>